welcome, welcome everyone. Welcome to the Bridge Builders of Diversity, where we are here bridging the gap between the disability community and the rest of society. We're building bridges of understanding through history, education, and personal stories. Teaching others how people with disabilities enrich our world and their intrinsic worth to our society. And having a laugh or two at the same time. Yes. <laughs> Today, we're going to discuss what uh, teachers can learn from parents who have a child with disabilities um, at your initial first IEP meeting and that process right before the IEP meeting. And I feel like a lot of people with a, with a child with disabilities, your child was, was identified early on, so you're bringing them into the public school at age three because of um, under IDEA. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the public school becomes responsible for delivering services for a child with disabilities when they turn three. So usually, much before they turn three, you're bringing your baby into the public school way before you normally would. Right. So one thing I did um, that was very helpful um, during the process of um, our IEP meetings, uh, Nathan was in early intervention, and then I started meeting with the, the school district and one thing I did was um, I did a little presentation on my son. So, um, you know, because teachers only know your kid on a piece of paper. They're just going to exactly. have the PT and the OT notes. And, um, and we're basically, we were getting <clears throat> someone else's interpretation right. of what your child is like. So what Sherry did was absolutely beautiful. And I love when parents do this. They made a list of the things that he likes the most yeah so that when he comes into school that first day and he's petrified or not petrified mm -hmm. some of them just aren't petrified they're ready to call me mom but um, but for the most part they're they're three years old and and it's a brand new environment strange people in a strange place doing strange things but if they have my favorite toy yeah. and they know that I love play-doh and fire trucks or they know that I want to be a princess when I grow up, that helps to make that connection and their transition into the, the public school environment go so much smoother. And I also made a list of things he could and could not do. Which is brilliant. Which is brilliant. That actually does part of my job for me so that I can... Um, I'm not going to ask him to do something that he's not ready to do, but I also know the thing. I have a, a list that came right from an authentic source to tell me what I need to work on right away. Right. These and are the things that we're working on. Especially like uh, needs and getting around the school, like Nathan uh, wasn't fully walking at three years old and he would still plop down and, and crawl. Um, his language skills. Um, my son is hard of hearing, so he was learning sign language. Um, so that was important that he had staff that could, could sign. Um, so it's kind of important to make a list of those things that they can and cannot do. That's very helpful. And, and so valuable for the teacher. This is not overstepping, bringing in lists like this. This, like I said before, makes, helps us make that connection deeper. Mm -hmm. And it also gives us a place to start. But right. as we develop our relationship with your child. And one of the most important things? Safety. Safety. Absolutely. Those are questions I always ask at yes. an initial PPT. Do we have any safety concerns? Are there any um, things that I need to know? Mm -hmm. I'm also going to ask about your child's sleep habits. Are they giving up a nap to come to school? That's an important thing to know. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what are their eat, eating habits like? Is this a child that I should be introducing new foods with? Or is it a kid who already eats a broad spectrum of food? Right. Now, my son was very busy, even though he couldn't um, walk so well at the time, but he could crawl everywhere. He was very fast, loved to put everything in his mouth, um, so little toys. Even or at three. Yes, right. even at three that, um, you know, some toys wouldn't have been appropriate for him to be in his area even for a three-year-old because he still loved to shove everything so in his mouth. So super important information for mm -hmm. the school staff to know that he's still yeah. mouthing or, or to know that he has no concept of stairs or, or anything. If he's a, if he's a, a runaway, um, we call them... Uh, yeah, he was a little bit of a flight risk. <laughs> a, yeah, that's what we call him. We call him a flight risk. Is this child a flight risk? 
But not we'll ask it. Not this that way. they're a criminal, but they are like <laughs> <laughs> right. But, but and we and we try to ask it like in a in a covert, like under the radar type of way. It was like, so what's it like when you're out in the community? You know, do you have to keep a death grip on them, or can you give them a little bit of space? Because we want to know what it's going to be like that first time we take them out in the playground. Are they going to dash across the field? Or are we going to be able to let them play safely and, and give them their parameters and know they'll stick in them? Yeah. <laughs> and another uh, of mine was triggers. Mm, that's important to know. Yeah. So loud noises, you would think people who um, are hard of hearing or deaf, there are actually some pictures that um, really set them off. Are irritating. Yeah, even yeah. my father, who's losing his hearing in his 80s, there's some noises that are so agitating to him. Oh, um, so like um, a practice fire alarm drill um, could set a child off. So that's very important for the teacher to know. So good to know. Um, so if to those, know. Um, if that might set them off. Uh, how to redirect their behavior. Well, that's another thing I have in here. Um, my son's easily redirected being silly or singing or something like that. Um, so those are very important things for teachers to know about. Absolutely, absolutely. It doesn't mean that we're not going to find a way to work through those triggers. Right. Because that's, that's what we do. But it's also good to know, like, are they going to respond negatively to loud noises? Are they going to respond negatively to unexpected touch? That's a good thing to mm -hmm. know. Um, yep. Are, they got, are there any, like, do they not like bright lights? Or do they crave constant stimulation? I, I, I like to know that a child is a sensory seeker so that I can make sure that I give them that input that they need so that they can focus later on learning. Right. And another thing I did was how my son learns best. Um, don't forget parents, um, you know, I know some parents are, are frightened of the educators because they have all these fancy degrees. We do. And we have, and we, use, we talk in alphabet soup. Don't be afraid to ask. Right. Don't but, be afraid to slow us down and say, what does all that mumbo jumbo mean? Because we forget that we talk in code. Right. Just kind of like your profession. Um, you have your own lingo for that, that you understand no matter what it is, whether you're a financial person or um, work in retail or, or whatever or it mechanic is. Or mechanic. Mechanic. You it, 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 have your own lingo. I don't understand anything mechanical, so right. I would need somebody to slow it down. Please don't be afraid when you go to an initial IEP. If you hear the <laughs> alphabet soup coming out, um, to slow the team down and make sure that you understand every acronym and every term that they're using. And one thing I say is parents, you have the PhD in your child. Absolutely. You I said know that your too. child best. And don't forget, you are an equal partner at that table. You're just as equal as the teacher or the special ed director or the PT and the Absolutely. OT. Absolutely. You are an equal player at that table. In fact, in some regards, we're relying on your expertise mm -hmm to help us do our job better. If, if we didn't have an open lane of communication and when parents like, like Sherry come in, it can be intimidating, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna lie. I, I told her this already, with that stack of papers and, and, and all of your requests and requirements, I, I, kinda, I kinda get a little bristly and say, hey, you're, you're, in, my, you're in my pool now, you're in my, when I went my to my first IEP person. meeting, I wrote my own IEP. Yeah, where it's mad, that would make me bristle up a little bit. Right. But, um, but now I put my shoulders down and I welcome that additional information because now right. I know what Sherry's expectations for her child are right. and what she feels like his progress should be in a year and so we have a real good jumping off place to have that communication about maybe we want to ratchet those those mm -hmm. um those iep goals back a little bit mm -hmm. and give him some time to acclimate before we go running right at them or hey you know what the team feels like he can do a little bit better and also remember it is your right to at any time during the school year or even outside the school year, to have that, that team reconvene right. and come back to the IEP and say, hey, you know, I think he can, he can do better, we can raise the bar, or hey, I think we need to pull this back a little bit because he, whatever. And before my son went into, um, uh, before we went into negotiations with the school district, 
um, I asked to see all the different classrooms and the programs and I compared them all and I broke down how many hours this one and that one mm. would give him and because uh, my son was already in an all-day um, daycare so I knew he could handle an all-day program and to me if he went to a part-time program that would have been like setting him backwards instead of progressing forward um, so and one thing I did was I brought my son with me to meet all those teachers um, we only had a little bit of time, but the school district was kind enough to let us go in. It was in June. That's a great thing to ask because yeah. teachers, if, I don't know, some teachers find it distracting to have the student there at an IEP. I personally love it mm -hmm. because I have, that gives me a few minutes when, when the parents talking to the speech pathologist or another, another member of the team, I have that minute to develop that mm -hmm. little bit of rapport or, or just get to know them and watch them, see how they move, see how they interact with mom, right. and see how they handle a new and weird place. You're sitting in a meeting room, right. and I might have toys out for you, or you might just be stuck with a pen and paper. That, you know, we got to see how they react in those situations. I actually asked if I could go see the classroom, so I met the teachers at the classrooms prior to the IEP meeting. Another great request, yeah. and something that most teachers are like, please come in. We love to have the children come yeah. in and look around for us so they're not just wandering into a strange place. But please ask first. Because yeah. yeah, make arrangements. School buildings might have things going on, especially mm -hmm. if it's in the summertime. It might be that the hallways are, are being stripped and waxed or something. Yeah, no, we made special um, appointments uh, to go and meet the teachers. It was all pre-planned. I had asked... Um, I believe probably the special ed director and they um, set it up from there if we could go and visit the classrooms I got to meet all the teachers and look at each different program um, you know some had more of a, a freer classroom some were kind of off more structured yeah more structured um, you know and then there's and collaborative know, again and, you have the PhD in your child right so you know what types of things are going to be super distracting or what types of things they love to have. And Sherry brought pictures. Yeah. I it, it, love this. Yeah, if you, if you can't bring um, your child with you for whatever reason, bring pictures so they can see how they interact with their siblings, and um, it, what you know activities what? Encourage they Encourage the teacher to take those pictures because I've, I've used the pictures that parents have provided for me as a tool to make, again, that, that connection look Look at how handsome your brother is, or yeah. look at look at how much fun you had that day with your with your family at the zoo, or whatever yeah. you're showing me a picture of the train ride. The tra yeah, I, I look at this picture of you having fun on the yeah. train ride, because that it, it it just it just gives me, it greases that pathway into that that relationship, it just makes it a little bit quicker, a little easier, and. Um, Okay, they're deliriously cute, and we love looking at them. <laughs> but don't be afraid to go. Like, one thing I did when my son was born, I mean, my son ha has Down syndrome, so we knew from the get-go he was going to need services pretty much. Not everybody has that luxury. Sometimes no. your child gets diagnosed, diagnosed much later, or maybe right before school, or it might be they might come to a diagnosis in preschool, that something right. that you didn't notice. Um, but these things all help. Right. But as soon as you know that your child um, is potentially going to need services, I would recommend start researching and making yourself familiar with the IDEA. Um, and what your local district has to offer. Yep. While IDEA is a federal law, every state and within states own. there are differences in, in school districts. How they how they handle the um, service delivery. Mm -hmm. Some some districts will have specific programs for students with specific needs. Others will be, uh, you know, fully in the general education classroom. And what um, you it, it you, you <laughs> as a parent sometimes it takes sitting down together as a family and deciding what 
what path you want to take and, and what you outcomes you want for your child. And you know what? They can change. And if you change your mind, it, it's never too late to say, hey, can we revisit that IEP again? Or can we sit down with the team and have a meeting? Um, you might get some blowback and poof, we're so busy and your child's not the only child. But in, in addition to asking, you can also be accommodating. And that, mm -hmm. that goes a long way to... Um, building that rapport with the school and saying, right. gee, I understand my child's not the only child in your classroom, but I really feel a need to revisit the IEP. Can we set a meeting at your next, at your earliest convenience? Yeah. And one resource I used was Rights Law, um, which they have books you can purchase that walk you through it. Uh, they give par parents like sample letters, like how to ask for certain services, how to open up like an IEP meeting, and I, so I purchased a few books. They even have a little video. Um, they have all kinds of resources on that page, and that was something I used um, that really helped me learn the whole process and and everything I needed to know to be a um, successful advocate for my son um, in getting. And initial. many communities also have parent advocacy yep. networks where yep. you can meet with parents who have gone before you into yes. the IEP process or who have been part actively involved in the public school and can give you um, strategies and ideas for what to expect and how yep. to kind of like a buddy system. It's yep. always good. I talk to a lot of other parents too as well to and got tips, um, but it is good to. Um, just have a general understanding of, of the law um, that's very helpful um, in going through it, especially initially um, in understanding the whole process. It made it much easier for me. I, I, some of it is, you know, a little over the head, but... <laughs> right. Well, yeah, when teachers start talking, their special code, their alphabet soup, that, it, that gets intimidating and we realize it. However, sometimes we, in the heat of the moment, might forget. and. You know, we really appreciate when someone says, hey, I don't understand that. Because, well, we are teachers, so we don't mind teaching you either. <laughs> right. They like to educate. We do. Um, and another thing I wrote down was short and long-term goals that um, I had for my son. Like, short-term goals were, like, lang language skills um, and developing vocabulary, mobility and safety. Um and you know uh, with his gross motor skills and having a safe environment for him so those were the short-term goals and um, long-term goals were obviously um, developing his language sign language um, which he had already had a pretty sizable vocabulary for a little guy with he's been working on it right? yeah yeah um, and walking and maneuvering on a playground um, you know I always say and these are very reasonable mm. um, you know, sometimes I've encountered parents that had like skewed goals, like they they were they were setting the bar too low or or way too high, and that that becomes evident over time. And knowing where their mind, knowing where the parent's mindset is, really helps to open up that conversation of saying, you know, hey, this short term goal is definitely manageable, but this long range goal that might take longer than you think. Right, that may take a few years. Right, you know. So, um, you know, don't be afraid to ask questions. Talk to the teacher. Please. Oh, yes. And don't forget, teachers love coffee and chocolate. Okay, mo all right, I love coffee and chocolate. But <laughs> Most of my son's teachers have, like, coffee and coffee chocolate. Coffee and chocolate, yeah. I've even offered to bring in um, coffee for meetings and stuff like that. So don't, don't be afraid to extend the olive if, branch. Yeah, if you can. If yes. you can, we all appreciate it. <laughs> yes. E even my school district... Um, my son had to be moved from one school to another and um, the woman um, was wonderful. I actually sent her an edible arrangement. Yes, oh. um, she was so helpful. Um, you know, so don't be afraid to send a little thank you. You don't have to be as extravagant that's it, yeah, as that's I thought. That's over the top. Yeah, it, it was appreciated, but over the top. It was extenuating circumstances <laughs> so that we're not going to get into in this video. But <laughs> But a kind word. Yes. A, a piece of chocolate um, or even and I always thank them after even an email uh, thanking them for the meeting and stuff like that deeply well. appreciated yeah deeply deeply appreciated because we get 
so caught up in that hamster wheel that hearing somebody say, hey, that you made me feel comfortable or it was really nice meeting you today goes mm -hmm. so far yeah. in, into building that relationship because the one thing that we do have in common is we love your child and we want what's best for them. And look at a parent. I'm Sherry. I'm a parent of a child with disabilities. And, and I'm Roberta. I'm a special education teacher. And see, we have met by chance. We did. And here we are. Bringing Sharing you our, our love for people who have different abilities. And we love telling people how they enrich our lives and yes. what they bring to our world. So, Absolutely. If you like this content, if you found it helpful, or... Thumbs up. Yeah, Hit thumbs the up. Hit the bell notification. Smash the button. Yeah, smash the button. Don't you don't have to be violent, but no, um, no, no violence. Just yeah, no violence. Just press the buttons. Um, check out Subscribe. our other content. If you have some burning questions, something that that we sparked an interest in, um, don't forget to comment. Feel free to comment. Um, be nice, but uh, and hashtag intrinsic worth. Intrinsic worth. Hashtag intrinsic worth of people with disabilities. Because we love sharing our love of people who are different with everyone. Yes. So like, share, subscribe. We love you. And we'll see you again. Yes. Thank you.